Well, a very good morning to you and welcome to St. Bartholomew's for our Christmas Day celebration. It's wonderful to gather together and celebrate this feast day in the church year when we remember and celebrate and worship God for sending his son into the world. Now, it wouldn't be Christmas without a bit of fire, so we need to light our Advent wreath. Could we have, I don't know, I haven't kept track of who's done it, four volunteers, Eliza. The reading is uh, from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 to 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has shined. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For, as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be disdained for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. Entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I understand that in America this year there was a bit of a controversy because this was the first year when a Charlie Brown Christmas wasn't being shown on public free-to-air television. If you don't know, Char Charlie Brown Christmas has became, from about 1965 onwards, a sort of staple of American festive TV. I suppose it's, it has something like the sort of cultural place as the snowman does for us in the UK. If you've not seen a Charlie Brown Christmas, if you don't know Charlie Brown at all, what happens in the story, I like it because it shares a name with me, Charlie Brown's Christmas plans all go wrong. He has all these great plans to celebrate Christmas with his friends, but then he gets really depressed at the commercialization of it all. That was in 1965. Imagine how he'd feel today. And he tries to put on a sort of Christmas production with his friends, but he buys the wrong sort of tree, and they all mock him for it. There's a moment when he looks up to the sky and shouts out, isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? And then his mate Linus, who normally has his thumb in his mouth and his security blanket, takes his thumb out and says, sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And then in the play, Linus comes to the middle of the stage and reads from Luke chapter 2. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And he reads the reading from the King James Version. Ends, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And he wanders over to Charlie Brown and says, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. But what does it mean 
When Linus does that, you, in, if, if you've seen it, it's an amazing moment. And everyone has their sort of, they're catching their breath. But just to read that reading doesn't really help us, does it, to, to tell us what Christmas is all about. I've got three words or three things that will help us understand that reading, and I think get us to the heart of Christmas. But they're hidden in three boxes somewhere in the front. So if you can see number one box, put your hand up. Thomas, come and come and come and come and get it for us. This is the easy one. Now you're all searching for two and three. Open the box. What have we got in there? A fish. A fish, a small fish, and there's a gold coin for you for doing such a good job. Go and sit back down. <laughs> now you really want to find box two and three. But here we have a very small fish. Now, does anyone know what sort of fish this is? Anyone got any idea? I will tell you, this is a lesser weaver fish. And in our family, this lesser weaver fish is legendary. I'm going to tell you a story about my sister who is ill with tonsillitis and isn't even here today. I feel a bit bad doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. When we were little, we were playing in the sea in Wales. And then I saw my sister sprint out of the ocean, run back up the beach, howling in pain because she'd been stung by this little thing, the lesser weaver fish, not even the greater one, just the lesser one. But let me read to you from a reputable source, Wikipedia, about how painful the sting of a lesser weaver fish is. The sting of a weaver causes acute and intense pain, which is frequently radiated to the area around the limb. The best way to help people is to reassure them of the relative harmlessness of the sting. You can imagine me and my brother did none of that reassuring. <laughs> we just laughed at it. You thought, a little weaver fish sting? Apparently it's up there with childbirth, but I wouldn't know. <laughs> now, why am I telling you about the weaver fish? Because it's a tiny little thing. This is actual size. It's a tiny little thing with an enormous impact. And that's the first, if you like, clue to what's going on in that reading. The most important thing in the story is the little baby, the tiny little baby that is going to have an enormous, enormous impact. But in the way the story is told, it, you really should be thinking that baby is totally irrelevant. At least at first. Because the big guy at first is Caesar Augustus. The tiny baby is nothing compared to the emperor of the whole Roman world. Caesar Augustus is the, is, the, is the person who should have the, the lasting impact beyond all comparison. Of course, he did have an incredible impact on history. But the baby is going to outdo him. So one historian said, he was a teacher and miracle worker who spent nearly all of his brief ministry in the tiny and obscure province of Galilee, often preaching to outdoor gatherings. A few listeners took up his invitation to follow him, and a dozen or so became his devoted disciples. But when he was executed by the Romans, his followers probably numbered no more than several hundred. How was it possible for this obscure Jewish sect to become the largest religion in the world? How was it possible for this little baby to have the impact greater, I'd say, than the weaver fish? How is it that he's still affecting the world 2,000 years on? Well, that's where we need to find our second box. Has anyone been able to spot it? Evie, you want to come and find it? Where do you think it is? Hidden in the tree. Very good. Right. Let's open I'm not sure we can match your costume, but have a look in there. What can you see? A silver crown. And go on, take those chocolates for you and your sister. There we go. Well done. So here's our second clue. A little paper crown. Now, no doubt you'll be donning one of these yourself later on at Christmas over lunch. But a little silver crown. Because here's the thing about that little baby. He is actually going to be claimed, crowned, if you like, as king. The key word in the reading to help you understand that is when he is called the Messiah. Did you hear it in the message that the angels have for the shepherds? Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now, the, the word Messiah actually means something like the anointed one. 
So when Queen Elizabeth was crowned queen, and it might well happen when we crown King Charles next year, when Queen Elizabeth was crowned queen, what happened? There was a really special moment. The cameras didn't capture it because it was so personal and so intimate. When the queen was anointed with oil, she had oil put on her head. And it was a way of saying that she was special because she was the queen. And that picture, actually, that image, that act of putting oil on her goes back to what people in the Old Testament did to the kings of Israel. They anointed them as the king. And that's who Jesus is going to be. But here's the thing. I suppose you could say that his crown is a bit like this paper crown. It's very weak, isn't it? Because the big guy with the crown is Caesar in our reading. And here we have a little baby. But actually, you know, it's the weakness. It's the fact that this crown is so frail that you could just tear it up like that. That actually points to how unbelievably significant, how big an impact Jesus is going to make. So Napoleon Bonaparte, who was a powerful man, the emperor of France, said once about Jesus, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. At the first Christmas, Jesus came into the world as the king, but a king like no other. Not like the ruler of the nation waging war, but like the refugee fleeing the war. That really is what is going on with all that stuff about the guest room. It's Mary and Joseph and their relatives trying their best to find anywhere to spend the night because they've been ordered around by the great powerful man, Caesar. That's how Jesus arrives, like a refugee. And in fact, that's how he lives his whole life, not wielding power and bossing people around, but giving of himself. So his crown might look weak to us, but actually that is how he's going to affect the world in the most enormous way, which is our third little box. I've been seeing people spying it. Sophie, do you want to come up? Now this one, I might have to go all the way around. In fact, go back the way you came and come up the centre, otherwise you'll trip over lots of cables and then we'll be in trouble. Are we going the long way around? Talk amongst yourselves. Here we come all the way up here and you have to come all the way up these steps. It's going to be worth the wait, I assure you. Where is box number three? Bring it out, bring it out. Don't trip down the stairs, very good. Right, what can you see in there? There's your coin, very good. And what's this? A sheep. Now this is a bizarre one, isn't it? You probably didn't spot any sheep in the reading, apart from with the shepherds, but this is not the sheep that we're talking about here. In fact, you might have heard about the sheep in that song we sang just before the reading. See amid the winter's snow, born for us on earth below, see the tender lamb appears, promised from eternal years. And there's another sheep in church beside this one. If you look behind me, on the, in front of the, the communion table, there's a sheep. But that sheep's even stranger if I get out of the way. You'll see he's a sheep carrying a flag. He's almost like a warrior sheep. And this is the extraordinary thing about Jesus Christ. He is a lamb, a tender lamb, as our second carol put it. And he is a lamb who will lay down his life. That's the thing about sheep, about lambs in Jesus' day. They were small and weak animals that were sacrificed so that people could, if you like, have the assurance that God loved them and cared for them and provided for them. It was a sort of picture of of saying, look, before God, we need someone to pay the price for the way that we've fallen short of God. And little lambs were the ways that, in Jesus' day, 
people would have come to the temple, given the lamb in their place, and gone away knowing, I have God's love. I have his favor. He cares for me. And this is how Jesus is a king is a small thing with a huge impact, like no one that any of us will ever have come across. This is why this reading is the heart of Christmas. Because at Christmas time, God himself came down all the way from heaven to earth as a tiny baby. And then in, in his life, it's not like he stopped there, he went even lower. He went to the, the depths of human experience even dying on a cross as a criminal, even though he'd done nothing at all wrong. That's why Napoleon said about him, this was someone who had an empire founded on love, because it was love that led God to come all the way from heaven to earth, all the way from earth to the cross, like this little lamb that in Jesus' day would have been sacrificed so that others could live. So, I wonder this Christmas time, will you be like Charlie Brown, and just throw your hands up in the air about the commercialization of it all? Will you despair when, heaven forbid, something doesn't go quite right at Christmas lunch? I'm sure it won't for you. Will you lose heart at the commercialization of it all? Or will you listen to Linus and follow the path, if you like, to this lamb who laid down his life, gave up everything out of love for us, in our communion service, of course, we will commemorate that self-giving of Jesus as we receive by faith his body and blood. But now we're going to stand and sing our next carol in praise of this wonderful king like no other. O come, all ye faithful. Let's stand and sing together.